Welcome and thank you for joining me for our exploration of New York, the greatest old world buildings. New York City, one of the older cities in the United States on the East Coast, situated on one of the largest natural harbors in the world and currently one of the largest metropolitan areas in the world, the most densely populated city in the United States and the largest city in the United States. This is often an area that is difficult for alternative researchers because, according to the narrative, this city has had a European presence on it since 1624, and it's been continuously occupied since then. Here's a photo from the 1860s, and this is what we'd expect to see. A very well-built-out city that makes a lot of sense with what we would term as either Victorian or Elizabethan architecture. We see another photo from the early 1870s, and again, this being the largest natural harbor in the world, or one of the largest, and the city that's developed on it. At this time, it's already been around for nearly 200 years. So this makes sense. There is not a series of conflicting accounts with the narrative that we can easily find inconsistencies with. We could actually believe that New York City is built out as it's depicted here. And even though this may not be an actual picture and it's just a drawing or a produced picture by an artist, it does give us an idea of what the city looked like with the City Hall, St. Paul's Church. We'd expect to see these kind of buildings and we understand why the city, being populated for a long time, being the central entry point for the United States at that time, it does make sense as to why this could be so built out. And we see Federal Hall, which is where the United States Revolution began, or at least the revolution of the colonies, to become the nation of the United States. New York has so many interesting aspects to it, though. There are so many intersections with it. Taking a look over here at the Battery on Manhattan Island. And our exploration is going to focus on Manhattan Island, specifically looking at the skyline and we're looking at the most significant buildings. Many of the buildings that we're going to be looking at on the Manhattan skyline were either, at one point in time, the tallest building in the world, or one of the most prolific buildings in the world. We look back here in this drawn picture and we see many cathedrals and many other large buildings, again in the early 1870s. And we can explain this, even with the narrative that we're given, as we're told it took decades or longer to construct many cathedrals. There's, of course, exceptions to that rule, such as the four-year cathedral we saw built in Cincinnati. Here's another depiction of New York City in the early 1870s. Oddly enough, we see what looks to be a completed Brooklyn Bridge, although it was under construction, or we're told it was under construction in 1873, which was exactly when this photo was or excuse me, this picture was produced. Again, we see some odd details in this particular rendering or this painted picture. It almost looks as though several of the blocks are lacking detail, as though we see something that almost looks like the Kowloon Walled City over in Hong Kong, here in New York City. We still see the familiar details that we saw in the earlier picture. And finally, we see a later picture from the early 20th century, where we see many of the skyscrapers that are built out. Now keep in mind we've just looked at painted pictures. Anybody could have drawn these. They could have put anything on them that they wanted. What about some photographs or some images that show us some hard proof? Or at least what we could derive from images. And here we see a comparison of the Manhattan skyline from 1872, 1902, and 1908. And many of the buildings that we'll be looking at, we do see two on the skyline. We see in 1872 the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge, and we see that the skyline only has a few buildings on it and many cathedrals. But then in 1902, we see that many skyscrapers and tall buildings have suddenly been constructed. And this is where the narrative finally reaches its questioning point, because we know that the first skyscraper was the New York World Building completed in 1890. And it appears in the 1902 picture. You can also see it in the 1908 picture. Finally, the Singer Building, which the tower was added and completed by 1908, and it just happens to appear in the 1908 picture. 
It's incredible the amount of tall buildings that were completed in a very short period of time. If we go off the 1902 picture and we factor in the fact that the New York World Building, pictured here in 1902, was built in 1890, and the rest of these taller buildings followed, that's a lot of construction to complete in 12 years. Is that truly possible? Is it practicable that the city of New York could have done that with all the labor they had available with the fact that it is one of the largest natural harbors in the world and it's a main intersection and entry point for the United States? Certainly they would have had the labor. But what about the feasibility and the amount of materials it would have taken to build all these buildings in that short amount of time? What do you think? Is this something that was feasible? Or was this something that shows that there's something else going on? Could this be some sort of evidence of alternate realities? Or does it really show that there's manipulation of the timeline? Someone's changing the five W's. The who, what, where, when, or why. So that we do not understand the how. All of these possibilities are on the table, and that's why considering New York City and the Manhattan skyline are very fascinating. The first building we're going to take a look at is the New York World Building. The New York World Building, also known as the Pulitzer Building, was a building in the Civic Center of Manhattan along Park Row, part of Lower Manhattan's former newspaper row. It was designed by George B. Post in the Renaissance Revival style. Yes, because what else would it be? Renaissance Revival style with an incredible dome on top of it and an amazing arched entryway. I wonder what other style name we could come up with it. Perhaps we'll just call it Dreamy Dome Style. The world building contained a facade made of sandstone, brick, terracotta, and masonry. Its interior structure included brick interior walls, concrete floors, and an internal superstructure made of iron. There were 12 full stories, two basements, and a six-story dome at the top of the building. The pinnacle above the dome reached 350 feet. When the building was in use, the world primarily used the dome, which was the newspaper, ground floor, and basements, while the other stories were rented to tenants. The world building's design generally received mixed reviews, with criticism focusing mainly on, or mostly on its immense scale. Now, why would that be, one wonders? Perhaps you're ready for the piece of resistance. How long do you think it took them to build this incredible beauty? 14 months. They, can, they started construction October 10, 1889, and completed it in December 10, 1890. I'll tell you what, those skilled artisans and all those immigrants that they had back then, they were unbelievably skilled laborers. They could do anything. We have to lament the fact that we don't really have interior pictures available, just drawings. And here we see the world building as some other taller buildings have come up, and yet it still stands out by virtue of its incredible dome and the Roman Forum type structure that we see. Only this one's built about six stories in the air. It almost appears like it's a capital building, yet when you look at the ground level, you see its arched entryway and all of the incredible stones that went into building it. Again, we see the scaling with the columns on it and some incredible detail with the windows, not to mention the height of the windows. This is a very beautiful building and it was quite a skyscraper for New York City to start with. And as we look up at, we see the detail of the dome and pediment, which is the triangular gable that I typically call the Roman Forum structure. And we also see the portal windows in the dome and then the high spire on the top of it. Just a building that you don't see a lot of examples of. Really a capital type building that seems like it was built in the format of a skyscraper. And now we move on to the Singer Building, a building that was constructed in phases from 1897 to 1908, with the tower being the final portion that was completed in 1908, and once the tower was completed, it was the tallest building in the world. This, of course, was a Beaux Arts and French Second Empire style. Now, we'll think of some names as we go through looking at this beauty. We have a construction photo of the Singer Building, although we have the same issues that we do with many other construction photos, and it's one of the recurring challenges with trying to verify the narrative. It's also a challenge with questioning it as well, because what do we make of these kind of photos? There's some detail that appears to be authentic, but then you have clashing detail. 
The interior of the Singer building is just otherworldly. You see these beautiful arches, these windows, and the detail in each of the columns and the pillars. Also the amount of detail that went into the ceiling work. What kind of material was this? And the handrail, and it looks as though all the floors had a lot of detail in them as well. It's a real tragedy that this building was eventually torn down. And we have to wonder why it was. And of course it was torn down during that period of urban renewal, which started in New York City a little bit earlier than the rest of the United States in the mid-1950s. Here we can see the Singer building with other buildings around it. And when we look in at the tower, we see the same type of portal windows and the otherworldly detail that comes with the tower. How can you even assign a style to this? This almost looks like science fiction renaissance style or H.G. Wells imagination renaissance style. I don't even know what you'd call this. Let me know in the comments. I've never seen anything quite like it, and there's something very striking about the tower. And it was the tower itself that made the Singer Building the tallest building in the world for a period of time, before it was surpassed by another building on the list that we're going to be taking a look at. Staying focused on the Singer Building, though, there's also detail in the lower portion of the tower. And yet we have other contrasting photos of the interior. Look at those portal lights, or excuse me, those portal windows up in the ceiling, along with the columns and the pillars, the elevators, the balcony, the stairs. This is just a gorgeous building. How could they have ever allowed this to be torn down? The sad story with the end of the Singer Building was with the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission created in 1965 in the wake of several notable buildings in the city having either been demolished or threatened with demolition. Although the Singer Building was considered to be one of the most iconic buildings in New York City, they never considered designating it as a landmark, which would have prevented its demolition. And from 1967 to 1969, they demolished it. A tragedy. You can see in the photo on the right what the demolishing looks like, and it's strange because of the fact that it could almost be mistaken for a construction photo. And you have to wonder if that's exactly how a construction photo would have been passed off. Now let's take a look at the Woolworth Building, and fortunately this is one that is still standing that you can still visit in Manhattan, New York City today. They started construction on this beauty in November 4th, 1910, and they finished it on July 1st, 1912. They could really get these buildings up quickly, couldn't they? This was designed by Cass Gilbert, another architect extraordinaire, in the neo-gothic style. Hmm, I kind of prefer Gotham Revival style, but okay, neo-gothic style. The building resembles European Gothic cathedrals. It was dubbed the Cathedral of Commerce in a booklet published in 1916. F.W. Woolworth, who had devised the idea for the Woolworth Building, had proposed using the Victoria Tower as a model for the building. He reportedly also admired the design of the Palace of Westminster. Gilbert, by contrast, disliked the comparison to religious imagery. Surprise, surprise. The architect ultimately used 15th and 16th century Gothic ornament on the Woolworth Building, along with a complementary color scheme. It was designed to be 420 feet high, but was eventually raised to 792 feet. Because, regardless of the design, raising it's no issue whatsoever. And this was, at one point in time, the tallest building in the world. Here we have our requisite construction photo of the Woolworth building, showing us the construction of the frame. Yet, it resembles so many other construction photos that we see. I would certainly love to see more detail of the establishing of the foundation, especially of these buildings. I wonder if there was any challenge in doing that in Manhattan, New York City. Here's the aspect that I want to consider, and I'd like all of you to consider as well. If the mainstream narrative is correct, how easy or how difficult was it for them to construct all these skyscrapers in New York City? The real challenge I see is not getting the material to the port, as this is one of the largest natural harbors in the world, but how exactly do you facilitate the construction and the work of multiple buildings at the same time in this very constrained urban environment? And if you've been to New York City at any point in your life, regardless of when it was, you certainly know that it is a vertical residence. Here's where I love seeing the construction of the tower. And yet, something seems off about this photo as well. We see the same telltale signs that we see in many other photos. 
So I'm not exactly sure what to make of it. I'm not going to come to any conclusions here. Because again, New York City has many conflicting accounts. Here it is once completed, the Woolworth Building. Supposedly modeled after Gothic cathedrals in 15th and 16th century Europe. Yet, oddly enough, we don't see any other buildings that look like this. So how exactly can you say that this is a particular style? Well, when it comes to architectural styles, we can say whatever we want to. Again, I prefer Gotham City Revival style. Or, perhaps, Dark Knight Revival style. Okay, my mind went there. In any event, looking at the gorgeous interior of the building, though, is what really tells the story. And this is why I would love to see photos of the construction of the interior. So if anyone has any access to photos of the construction of the interior of the Woolworth building, I would be delighted to see them. Look at this detail on the ceiling, the entryway. There is definitely something that went into this. And I find it hard to believe that they were able to put this building up in the time that they did because of this kind of detail on the inside. Even if you did have the artisans to pull this off, how could this have been done in such a short amount of time? And if all this was completed in the time frame that we're given, and this all happened in the mainstream narrative that we're given, we have truly lost tremendous capabilities just in the last 100 years. And that alone should be alarming. And when anyone asks the question about why we're doing this kind of research, if all it does is lead to some explanations that don't make any sense, or even back to even considering the mainstream narrative, and here's the beautiful skylights that I always love seeing that I've seen in many Capitol buildings and other buildings along with incredible stairs, archways, and the beautiful internal detail. Calling this building a giant cathedral is no stretch of the imagination. It is something that defies simple explanation and it's just gorgeous. Going back to what I was saying though, even if this all leads back to confirming the mainstream narrative, and let's just say that it did, then we have to ask other questions about how we lost this capability and why we allowed this to happen. And you look at this photo. This matches the greatest beauty that I've seen across the world. The interior of this building, and you can see the materials, and you can go to this building and actually touch the interior and determine that it is all hard material, that there is no cheap facading on the inside. They managed to do all of this. And if we accept the mainstream narrative in a very short amount of time, something is not adding up though about it all. And that's why we have to keep asking these difficult questions. And I believe that the Woolworth building, which does still stand today and is a place that you can visit and verify. And then again, of course, we see the floor as well, as if everything else isn't enough. There is something completely and totally extraordinary about the very existence of this building regardless of who really built it or when it was truly built. And I think it's interesting to me that people just want us to maintain a very blasé sense when we see buildings like this. And yet you see there are tourists that'll come and take pictures and they'll accept the narrative and then they'll move on and they won't think twice of it. And now we move on to the New York Stock Exchange building in the financial district of Lower Manhattan in New York City. It's the headquarters of the New York Stock Exchange. Composed of two connected structures, occupying part of the city block bounded by Wall Street, Broad Street, New Street, and Exchange Place. The central section of the block contains the original structure at 18 Broad Street, designed in the classical revival style by George B. Post. The northern section contains a 23-story office annex at 11 Wall Street. The marble facade of 18 Broad Street contains colonnades facing east towards Broad Street. Broad Street Colonnade, an icon of the New York Stock Exchange, contains a pediment designed by John Quincy Adams Ward and Paul Whelan Bartlett, depicting commerce and industry. We'll take a look at that pediment in a second. The facade 11 Wall Street is simpler in design, but contains architectural details similar to those at 18 Broad Street. New York Stock Exchange has occupied the site on Broad Street since 1865, but had to expand its previous building several times. This structure at 18 Broad Street was erected between 1901 and 1903. Again, two years. They could really just knock them out then, couldn't they? And there is our pediment depicting commerce and industry. Well, I wonder if that's just an honest depiction of commerce and industry. Very intriguing commerce and industry, as though you have some people that are crawling on their hands and knees, trying to make a living. You have some children integrated in there. 
How exactly does that represent commerce and industry? I don't know, maybe there's somebody out there that can explain it to me in the comments. We see the usual detail on the columns, and again, the New York Stock Exchange looks like it was something that was added in an afterthought. Also look and see all those lion's heads up there, above this so-called pediment. Very intriguing. What is with this central figure, and how does this represent commerce and industry? Is this some sort of deity that I haven't heard of? Well, as always, I welcome interpretations in the comments, and perhaps I'm missing something. I don't know if I really see anything representing commerce and industry. I see toil and almost, perhaps, paying proper tribute to the proper authorities when it comes to deification. I'm not sure. What do you make of it? Even this is a very beautiful entrance, considering the detail that goes into it, and yet once again the New York Stock Exchange feels like it's something that was added in an afterthought. And if you're ever around New York City, this actually conveys the idea that everything feels very compressed within it. And if you've ever been in such a city like this, it constantly gives you that feeling. This is the original photo after completion of construction in 1903. Very interesting how they managed to pull all this off, and yet they really didn't have motorization at that time, and heavy equipment was very limited. Yet it's a very beautiful building, and you can see all the detail that went into it. The interior is nothing less than the exterior. Look at the windows and the walls, along with the detail, of course, put in the ceiling. Because how else would you know that you're actually in a stock exchange building? We've seen the interior of this building in several films throughout time, and I'm always reminded of uh, one of my favorite uh, 80s films, Trading Places, with Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy. Very entertaining film, and quite an interesting message. And here's a photo from 1904 of the facade. I don't know how you could ever call that just a facade. It's utterly incredible what the entryway to the New York Stock Exchange truly looks like. Again, we have all the pillars, and look at that on the building right there. There's even a smaller pediment. You just see pediments everywhere you look. Pediment here, pediment there, here a pediment, there a pediment, everywhere a pediment. Start a song about it. I don't know. There's something with the New York Stock Exchange that seems to indicate that there is much more going on. And here's another interior, modern interior photo of one of the main conference rooms. Look at the beauty in the ceiling and the arches in the walls. You just can't go into one of these buildings and not expect to see this kind of beauty at this point. And I think that's always the other telling aspect is when you look at the interior. And I've endeavored to try to include more interior photos in the explorations because I believe that's where the rest of the story is told. And it's very, very rare that we see photos of the construction of the interiors of the buildings. And if you come across them, if you see them, and I don't care if they're questionable, please send them my way. Apparently, this is some sort of rendering or design of the New York Stock Exchange. Although, this goes back to that old question, is this done by a designer or a recorder? This definitely feels like a recorder. Again, I see the depiction of commerce and industry on the pediment. Quite a fascinating interpretation. And now we save the most incredible for last, the Empire State Building, the 102-story patented Art Deco skyscraper in Midtown Manhattan. Designed by Shreve, Lamb, and Harmon and built from 1930 to 1931, during the Great Depression, they put up the tallest building in the world at 1,250 feet, a record it held until it was surpassed by the World Trade Center in 1970. The Empire State Building, an incredible, gorgeous Art Deco building, and a true, pristine staple of skyscrapers in New York City. And here we have the requisite construction photo of the Empire State Building with the rigid airships and a couple blimps. Very intriguing when we consider this building's reputation of having its spire as a docking port for rigid airships. Something that definitely ties into many old world theories with all the towers and taller buildings and perhaps even lighthouses. And we see its quintessential format in the Empire State Building. Also very fascinating that such a photo would even be taken, showing all these airships and blimps in the immediate vicinity of the building. Was that taken into account with its original design and construction? And if this building was truly built by a different civilization with a different purpose, could this photo have been from that time? 
Or is this an authentic photo? Or is this a photo that's been altered in some way? They will tell us that this is the rigid airship, the USS Los Angeles. But how do we know for sure? Or how do we know that the photo is not altered in some way? Some incredible construction photos where we have another very brave worker who was obviously embracing the mentality of work or starve and die. And of course, he was not concerned about falling or doing a wily e. coyote from that incredible height, as you can see in this photo. We always question these photos as well, if they're depicting what's really happening. Why is it always a single worker, though, or just a couple? Why do we not see more wider shots that show more workers? It would have taken a lot of time to tighten all those lug nuts and all those bolts in there. I suppose it could have been done. You see the Chrysler building there, the beautiful building in the distance. How much labor was really taken on this building, and how did they do it in such a short amount of time and during the Great Depression? Did you know that a B-25 bomber crashed into the north side of the Empire State Building in 1945? Apparently it was an accident that killed 14 people. The bomber pilot found himself in fog. And keep in mind this is at the tail end of World War II after the surrender of Germany, but before the capitulation of Japan, supposedly. In any event, I had never heard of this, and I was rather surprised about this. Now, in the official history that we have, and this is what a B-25 bomber looks like, we're told that this bomber crashed into the north side of the building and that this event killed 14 people. However, this was not considered a major event because at no point in time did the structural integrity of the building face any sort of stress from this incident. Isn't this very interesting? And this is a photo that was taken after the B-25 had crashed into the north side of the Empire State Building. And you can sort of see the fire up there towards the top floors behind that uh, column of smoke or steam or whatever's in the foreground. Interesting photo and very blurry. I guess it does indicate that it could be foggy or it's just the smoke. Hard to say, but it's very intriguing to me that this did happen. And here's a photo from the cleanup. And yet, this was a minor inconvenience for the Empire State Building. It did not threaten its structural integrity, and the very next day after this accident, the floor was opened, and they were operating as if nothing had happened. They really knew how to build them back then, didn't they? And they could build them in a very short amount of time. And I've been to the Empire State Building. It was back in 2006, and I remember just being awed at its size, and yet the detail that you see in the base. And of course, they'll call it the Art Deco style. But it's still just amazing the amount of time that this stellar skyscraper was constructed. And here's some of the interior of the elevators that you can go into. There's just something, again, otherworldly about this building. Yet it seems like it's something that we built. We're told that our civilization built it. Yet there are so many other different connotations and meanings to it. And you look at this grand entry hall and you see all the detail and the material that went into it. And when you go in this building, you'll again find that no expense was spared. It's beautiful. All the material is genuine. And it was built during the Great Depression. Welcome to the Restitutor Orbis channel, and today we're beginning an exploration of Buffalo, New York. The beautiful, majestic city that sits right on the edge of Lake Erie, and is also the terminus point of the Erie Canal. This incredibly beautiful city with its varied architecture seems to contain many things on the surface, and yet there's a lot of hidden aspects about Buffalo that make it a tremendous old world city. It was the site of a World's Fair at the start of the 20th century, a well-planned out and developed World's Fair with amazing beautiful buildings that were told are temporary. It was also electrified, and at the same time it consisted of the tragic assassination of President McKinley, who received a tomb thanks to the generous donations of children. It also has many griffins, the symbol of one of its major colleges. It also has a vast underground network with many access points. It's also the terminus point of the Erie Canal, an amazing engineering achievement. Is this truly an old world city? Let's begin the exploration and find out. Buffalo seems to have the same layout and design pattern that we see in many of these cities where we're given the impression that the city was planned out from the very start. 
Now that would make a lot of sense, and yet we see a perfect plan for a city, and not what we'd expect to see, such as a military fortification. Here's an early drawing or rendering of Buffalo, and it doesn't look like there's much going on. In fact, this looks like it could be the view from my deck if I lived along the lake. We don't really see too much aside from some boats and maybe some very rudimentary ships that are actually out on the lake. We're also told with the typical history that it was the home of the Native Americans, and that makes sense. Although, one of the interesting things I find with the account of the Native Americans is the fact that we're told that they didn't recognize territorial boundaries. It's a major plot point in the film and book Sun of the Morning Star. But apparently other Native Americans did. We also have a couple bird's eye views of Buffalo, one from 1880 and one from the early 20th century. And in this one from 1880, we see that the city is very tremendously built out already. Now, Buffalo has a similar history as the other cities that we've looked at, such as Cleveland, where the city started at the early part of the 18th century. Or, or correction, at the early part of the 19th century, the end of the 18th century. And yet, in a hundred simple years, the city developed and grew at an extraordinary rate. It does have the typical fire story that we get with the city, although Buffalo's occurred in 1862 during the United States Civil War, and seemed to be a minor inconvenience where only 30 to 40 buildings were destroyed, instead of the usual hundreds or thousands, as some accounts of city fires give us. Yet, in all the renderings and historical depictions we see of Buffalo, we're amazed by just how built out it is how large many of the buildings are, and also what we see in many of the images, whether they're from 1880 through 1910. Of course, I always found it interesting how many of the dates that are associated with the photos from that time period could very easily be changed. People will tell you, well, if you see an automobile, then it must be something after 1900. But is that necessarily the truth? We don't know for sure. The other thing that obfuscates the actual account of history or the visual account of history is the presence of the electric trolleys, which there's no shortage of in any of the photos of Buffalo. But what you do see are incredibly well-built masonry constructed buildings. And you can even see here the railways that went down the middle of the street. Was the street paved? Was the street bricked? Did the rails come first? Did the street come first? We just don't know. What it looks like we're seeing seems to be the ruins of a city that's been cleaned up. And here with this church in this photo, supposedly dated from 1870, but again, who knows for sure, where we see the ruins and wreckage. Was it rebuilt? Was it torn down? Were the masonry blocks used elsewhere? We just don't know for sure. And yet we see in all these photos of Buffalo just amazing buildings that have incredible architecture and clearly took a lot of effort to construct. Yet the timeline is quite similar as it is in the other cities that we've looked at where it seems as though there was no limitations on resources, whether it was labor, finances, or even just the simple will to construct these buildings. And we'll be told that people worked as hard as they needed to, they had no safety standards, and that's how they were able to pull off all these incredible and stunning architectural achievements. Yet when you look at these buildings and you look at the various squares of Buffalo, where they're situated, you realize that once again, the historical account seems to be at best clouded, and at worst, out and out of fabrication. Now, people say, well, based on that, it's fair to call that out, but why should you be making theories about what's really going on in the city? And I'll explain why. Having theories is the point where it starts to really gain an understanding of what truly happened may have began. Now, at the same time, you have to consider the fact that a theory is fluid. Based on evidence, based on what you see, and based on what you discuss with others, you have to be willing to modify that theory. Here in this photo of a celebration, we can see on the skyline very large buildings, a very beautiful and well-constructed skyline already. Many will say, well, of course, it was simple to build large buildings and many skyscrapers from 1890 to 1900. It was the second Industrial Revolution. And we'll always point back to the Industrial Revolutions as the evidence that we had the technological capability to build these incredible and stunning architectural achievements. Look at this building. Does this make any sense on the skyline? What exactly is this? And yes, I see that we have some church steeples, but I'm talking about this building here on the right. Very incredible. President McKinley met his untimely demise through assassination during the Pan American Exposition, which took place in Buffalo in 1901. It's been extensively covered in a lot of the alternative researchers' focuses on World's Fairs. World's Fairs are always very interesting because it seems as though they are shaping a historical account, not just in the past or how we're supposed to look at the past, 
but then also shaping it what the future was going to be after the World's Fair occurred. For example, the Buffalo World's Fair seemed to shape what we expected to see in the 19th century and then what we were going to see in the 20th century since it occurred in 1901. President McKinley's monument is very interesting. It's not located in Buffalo, it's in Ohio. But what makes it interesting is the fact that it was supposedly funded by the donation of children. Make of that what you will. Back to Buffalo. We just see the well-developed square area here with the beautiful monument, and here you see some of the electric trolleys, which again seem to pose no technological challenge for that transitional time frame. And now we begin by looking at the Buffalo City Hall, an extraordinarily beautiful Art Deco building, also one of the tallest and most magnificent municipal buildings in the United States. And of course we have the usual details that we're told with Art Deco buildings. And this one didn't even begin construction until after the market crash of 1929 occurred. And they built it in two short years, or one year depending on what accounts you look at. And we see the usual gorgeous detail and beauty in the tower. The towers of these Art Deco buildings I always find just extraordinary because of all the effort they put in constructing the detail. And from the interior, just looking at the beauty of this glass the circular pattern in it and all the different colors. Remember that this building was constructed at the start of the Great Depression and we always look in the interior of these Art Deco buildings where we see another whole portion of what the real story is. Unmitigated and unrelenting beauty. Beauty and art and yes that's why they call them the Art Deco building. But what's really going on here? What does this building really give a true account of? Because we've seen Art Deco buildings in other cities even in smaller cities such as Rochester, Minnesota with the Plummer Building. Yet this is an extraordinary Art Deco building that seems to defy even the standards of Art Deco buildings. And this was built for municipal purposes in Buffalo. And the whole reason given for constructing this incredible city hall, even though they already had a beautiful and extraordinary one, was because their population was increasing. Once again, our testing point for old world buildings is that this is a site of weddings. And why wouldn't you want to get married at a beautiful municipal building like this? And again, this is where I always laugh when people say that those who defend the mainstream account, it's just a simple municipal building. There's nothing extraordinary about it. Yes, look at these beautiful elevator doors. Brass, or they could even be made of gold. Not saying they are. It does look like brass. But again, consider the focus on beauty. Consider the focus on being aesthetically pleasing and how, once again, this is one of these buildings that also reaches the internal portion of a human being. And even this, where you see the trappings of legislature and city affairs occurring, this does not look like a room that one would be depressed to be in. Inside and outside, this building has so much detail as the so-called Art Deco buildings tend to. I also enjoy the fact that the columns on this particular municipality building seem to almost look like fascies. What do you think in the comments? Do they bear a striking resemblance or is that just my imagination? Whatever direction you look at this building, from whatever perspective, you can see that it's beauty and it's always been beauty. One to two years and during the Great Depression, that's all they needed to construct it. Well, of course, the Great Depression affected different people and different entities in different ways. Some seemed to be completely down on their luck and had no choice but to commit suicide, unfortunately. And yet it seemed as though every government at every level was rife with funds and continued their construction projects without pause or hesitation. And, of course, we're also told that they had unlimited labor because everyone was out of work at that time frame. Yes, you know, the Great Depression such an interesting time. Whatever happened, this beautiful building stands today in Buffalo. And it's something worthy of our attention and focus. And it's something that you can go visit today. Of course, they've decorated it with their local NFL team, much as I recall the Union Station in Kansas City being decorated as a Kansas City Chiefs shrine. Well, here's the Buffalo Bills shrine, because you may as well use the municipal building for it. We do have some construction photos, and I'll just let you look at the construction photos and come to your own conclusions. But supposedly, this square that's right in the middle of the city didn't have a large-scale building on it. This one just happened to be constructed and built. And once again, you see that the layout of the building and its internal construction matches the photos that we just looked at. Insert sarcasm. 
It always amazes me how these buildings look so pristine when they're building them, but then when you see the photos right after they're completed, it's as though they added the coloring. And people will tell you, well, it's merely an architectural process. It looked new while it was being built, and the day after it was completed, but then the coloring just subtly changed. It only took a year, or a month, it depends on who you ask. You start to see, though, that what was the effort required to complete this building? There are some photos available supposedly on the ground that show them constructing parts of it, but I just don't know. And now we go to Buffalo Central Terminal, our train station. This actually was completed in 1929, right before the Great Depression. And I question the fact that they have a beautiful tower on this. And it is a very beautiful tower. Why is this beautiful tower required for a train station? Well, last I checked, trains operate on the ground. So do you put a beautiful tower so you can put a large clock? Well, it doesn't look like a very large clock. And this is the 1920s. Everybody had watches at that time. Was the beautiful tower there so you could go up to the top floor and you can watch the trains roll in and out and you can get a view, good view of the city? Here's an aerial photo of it. And we can see that there's just something about this train station that doesn't quite make sense. It seems to be very excessive. Why put the effort and expenses into this? when you would think that you'd want something laid out on the ground a little bit more. Why even have it more than one story? Another question that I have. And once again, looking on the internal facets of this building. Incredible, beautiful arches, a well-designed floor. No detail spared, just for a train station. Because when you're going to a train station, you need to be inspired by beauty when you go from one train to the next. And we've seen this repeated theme in cities all across the United States. It's as though they had no limitations if we're to believe the mainstream historical account about how these buildings were built. And keep in mind that all these buildings were built at the exact same time. So I find that story of all these magical traveling laborers who had no safety standards and were willing to work to death just a little questionable. Even today, this building reflects incredible beauty. And it still stands. Something else that you can go visit and verify for yourself. The condition of the internal construction materials, the floor, and you can even look up at that tower. And question to yourself, is the mainstream account truly accurate? Once again, what is the purpose behind these extremely high ceilings? Why bother with the beautiful decoration on the interior arches? Those are questions to be asked of the people who built this building in the late 1920s, if that's what we want to go with. Yet there is no shortage of inspirational images from this incredible building. A train station? Or did it have another purpose? Once again, it has another very large tower that has a small clock on it. And here we see that there's a clock inside the building. So once again, I'm struggling to come up with an explanation. Yes, here's our very convincing and beautiful construction photo, as though they built it in strange phases. It is interesting, though, that we see what appear to be more modern cranes on this one. I was kind of hoping to see some of our hamster wheel cranes, but, you know, it's the 1920s they had moved on. Supposedly, heavy machinery is much more widely available. And here's another aerial shot of this, and again, we see this elaborate beauty in both the tower and even in the main structure itself. Lots of room for parking, too. I wonder, in operating as a train station, if this was more efficient than our modern airports. What do you think, especially given how modern airports have gone? On to the Buffalo Savings Bank, another beauty from 1901, because, you know, what other kind of buildings are you going to build to be banks in 1901? Here we see that it has the usual dome, the beautiful columns, the arched entryway, and it has a nice clock on it too, so, you know, you could set your pocket watch off that as well. What is the point of the balcony there above the door? You know, is that in case the bank president wants to get out there and watch people come into the bank and realize this is a very successful bank? I mean, to say nothing of the fact that people have no choice but to go into it. Look at the gallery and the entryway. And there's a little pediment there as well. And another pediment off to the left over the door. Look at the beautiful artwork and the large blocks. This is 1901. Well... Here's our Buffalo Asylum, if you will, that was later converted supposedly into a hotel. And we know the story with asylums, and I just included this to show that, yes, there is an asylum in the cities as well. It doesn't seem to be something that was entirely isolated to the rural areas of the United States or other nations. Although, it does make less sense in the rural areas. 
it's important to note that they did have structures like this around the cities. So I'm wondering what the true account of them was. What was their actual purpose? I have suspected that they were some sort of sanctuary that was established as some forces in the previous civilization were aware of the reset. But those are just theories. It's a very beautiful and old building, and you could see why it would function well as a hotel. If you think about the supposed design layout of the asylums, they do just happen to function well as hotels, as you have many different rooms and a lot of varied space. Not to mention the fact that they're always three to four floors, it seems like. The asylums always get more mysterious the more you look into them. And then, of course, you add in the fact that now they try to factor in that they were haunted or there's some other horrifying thing that occurred within asylums. And there's no doubt that terrifying events did occur within asylums because we're always told about it. It's as though someone wants us to know. Here's the uh, internal photo or an interior shot, and you can see how beautiful this building is on the inside. You could see why this would function well as a hotel, as it conveys luxury and not simple convenience and modernity, such as our current hotels do. Well, let's move on. Edmund B. Hayes Hall. This beauty was built in 1874 as part of the University of Buffalo. 1874, and yet we see the pediment and an incredible large tower that will be told is simply a clock tower, although there's also a beautiful window in it. And then we see another little subsidiary tower off to the right. These university buildings are always intriguing because they give the impression of something being older, and yet at the same time, they still reflect the construction techniques that we tend to see with what we'd associate with Greco-Roman. Well, I guess Greco-Roman affiliates with university and education, just like a dome associates with democracy, especially if you're in the United States. There's some interesting perspectives behind this building, and you can also see the subsidiary tower on the left side a little bit better in this photo, as there's one on the right. It's a symmetrical layout, and yet it has three very obvious floors, and we'll even start to allude to what sort of underground presence there may be with these buildings, because there is a very extensive underground that we'll be getting to with Buffalo. I'm always intrigued by what I see with the beauty in the tower and the very tip of the tower because there we're getting the hints of some potential previous technology. Now people say it's simply a weather vane, but why do you need a weather vane then on the subsidiary towers? They're not the tallest towers. Nobody ever bothers answering those questions though because in you know, mainstream account it's good enough for you and you don't want to question things. And if that's the way you feel, that's fine. I'm intrigued by the fact that there is also a pediment on the front entry hall as though they could never get enough of those when they were constructing these buildings. There's something to be said for geometry and symmetry and how it relates to the aesthetic beauty of these buildings. Now we'll say, well, we have geometry and symmetry in our modern brutalist and postmodern buildings. True, but it's very simplistic and there tends to be a lot of 90 degree angles in all of our modern buildings. And I do wonder why that is. Yet when you see a pediment, there's not a single 90 degree angle. There's an older photo of it, supposedly, and you can see in this photo some of the larger blocks that were used to construct what looks to be the base of this tower. And I'm wondering what kind of materials these are constructed out of. Typically, we're told sandstone or limestone. The Buffalo Albright Knox Art Gallery Museum, supposedly built as part of the Pan American Exposition in 1901, but they tell us it was delayed and not completed until 1905. Of course, I'm wondering, how is this building still standing today if it was only built to be temporary? Obviously, it was not built to be temporary, but I'm sure we can go back and we'll find some reasonable explanation. I'm not going to bother because I'm not going to believe the reasonable explanation, but if you want to, feel free to do so. We see that it seems as though they're trying to continue to obfuscate this building by putting some beautiful postmodern buildings around it, and naturally it seems to detract from this building's natural beauty. Isn't it interesting now there's another wing of it that you can see over there, again with the pediment and the columns. And here's an early 20th century photo, and we can see just how unbelievably gorgeous this building is. And it includes a little bit of a rotunda under the pediment, and massive columns and stairs, because, you know, how else are you going to build an art gallery unless it is a beautiful building itself? Of course, as you can see where we've gone with that approach with the contemporary. Lots of glass and lots of boring rectangular and square shapes with lots of 90 degree angles. I don't have anything against 90 degree angles. It's just we see so many of them in modern construction and architecture. Just looking at the columns on this, you can see a little bit of the subtle beauty. And people will point to the fact that, well, in the 19th and the 20th century, this was the only way to build 
It's not the way to build today, though, and that's simply the reason we don't do it. Oh, yes, and we don't have unlimited funds today, although we never seem to have any issue continuously raising the debt ceiling. So I don't know what to tell you on that one. Just appreciate this beautiful building and the fact that it's still there. And also consider the fact that on the inside, you still see some subtle hints of this beautiful and amazingly advanced architecture, which somehow seems very far ahead of what we do today. But we just don't opt to do it, and we lack the money. Now we look at the griffin. The griffin, which is the symbol of the beautiful college. And the college we're specifically referring to is Canisius College, a private Jesuit college in Buffalo that was founded in 1870, naturally. And we see the usual architecture in what's supposedly the main administration building, but if anyone's been here, please let me know in the comments. Beautiful dome, beautiful columns. So I wonder if they were teaching democracy through the Society of Jesus. And I'm being a little facetious, but it's very interesting. Look at this old building, and of course we have the classic large portal window on it, which seems to have a flower pattern, and we wonder if that has something to do with cymatics or if it's just a coincidence. Here's an older photo of Canisius College, and here you can see the main building, along with the way all these houses are arrayed, which is something that reflects something we've seen in San Francisco with the orderly construction of the houses. Now that doesn't necessarily reflect anything old world, it's just an interesting detail to observe. There's our good old friend the pediment appearing just under the dome, so it looks as though this building has it all. About the only thing I don't see, oh, no, wait, there they are, the columns right under the pediment. Where else would they be? So, all the usual trappings. And now let's consider the beautiful underground of Buffalo. In these city explorations, I've decided to expand to consider the undergrounds because all of them have an underground. And I will be doing a video where I just explore the concept of what these undergrounds can mean with these cities. But in summary right here, we see that Buffalo has a very well-developed underground. There are passageways that run from many of the major buildings, many of the universities, and of course from the city hall, or so we're told. I haven't been there, but I'm going off of other accounts right now, and these are some of the beautiful images from it, where you see a remarkable amalgamation of things that look both artificial and natural. Of course, looking down this cavern, unless I actually walk in it personally, I'm wondering if this gives the impression of an older civilization that was subjected to extreme forces and then a newer civilization built on top of it. However, I'm open to other theories and I'm not sure what to make of this. It's just quite incredible and these images are very inspiring and again this is something that somebody would look at and just think well you know the account that we're given is just what the account that we're given is and when you see something like this it looks very artificial you just don't know. So I'm not sure what to make of it and yet was this planned, was this designed, or is this simply the remnant of an older civilization? Don't know. Well, now we go to the piece of resistance, the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal, completed from 1817 to 1825 at a distance of 354 miles. There is a lot of beauty in this canal, and in simple terms, it connects the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes. It's an incredible engineering achievement, and we'll be told that it was done simply by the force and will of the New York governor at the time, and the vast plethora of Irish immigrants that they had coming in. We're also told that these Irish immigrants who worked very hard to first clear the land, and then dig out the canal, were under racist attacks or ethnic attacks at the time. And yet, for some reason, they just continued to work, despite all this happening. Still an incredible achievement, and what really happened with the Erie Canal? When we look at the fact that there seemed to be maps completed of it before it was completed, at least that's what we're told in the official account, we'll be told to not question this because these maps were simply part of planning it. But why would you go through the trouble of building a map that's a plan when you haven't finished the Erie Canal at a time when it wasn't easy to render or design things? Well, just don't ask questions. Just accept the fact that this canal exists that it is like it is today. You can even drive under it in a place. Yes, apparently that was no issue with an engineering challenge at that time either, because why wouldn't you do something like that? It's not enough to just build a canal using only human and horsepower. You have to make it a very beautiful canal, and it's very easy to construct something like this in eight years that's over 300 miles. Now, you can do your own research and check the details on it and see how well it holds up to scrutiny, if you care to apply any scrutiny, or maybe you're just content to take the mainstream account as it is. It's not for me to tell you what to think. However, I do find it fascinating that there's a lot of engineering beauty and detail in this canal. It's also very interesting that it runs through many cities that still have many surviving old world buildings. 
So I think it's safe to say that in our estimation, there's a theory that the Erie Canal and the connection between the Atlantic and Lake Erie consisted of many old world communities. And all this infrastructure seems to be beyond what means were capable at the time from 1817 to 1825. Of course, historical account has an answer for that. They improved the canal over time. They replaced a lot of this infrastructure, and it was easy to do. Never mind the fact that we struggle to even maintain this infrastructure today, and we certainly don't seem to bother building anything like it today. I'm sure there is a very legitimate explanation for that, and it has nothing to do with money. I don't want to hear the money excuse because just raise the debt ceiling again. I wonder what architectural process they call with this. Chlorification greenification, you know, where you actually have living things growing on stones. I'm sure that was part of the architectural plan as well. There's also all these little signs and historical callouts to the Erie Canal. Old Erie Canal, formerly called Canton, Memphis, was halfway stop. An original canal route, 179 miles from Buffalo and 183 miles from Albany. Because remember, digging all that out and also building all these locks was just very easy to do. All it took was determination, no safety standards, and oh, by the way, never mind the fact that your primary workforce was the victim of ethnic attacks. That didn't stop or delay anything either. And here's another view of that uh, tunnel that runs under the Erie Canal. I just find this all so interesting that they throw in all these little details to this story. Well, that's what makes the history seem real. No one could possibly make this up. It doesn't matter how impossible or absurd it may be. And here's an example that you can see of some of the incredible buildings in the other towns that run along the Erie Canal. Bluffalo is the terminus point of the Erie Canal, where it goes and feeds into the actual Lake Erie. Yet there's so many different images of the infrastructure, there's so much detail with it that defies simple explanation. We're also told quite comically that President Jefferson laughed at the concept of even building a canal in New York. And that's kind of what we'd expect a president to do, is just laugh at a national effort to build a canal. So he just left it to the governor of New York. At least that's what the official account says. Whether this canal is 353 or 354 miles, it's incredible. And now on to the Pan American Exposition, the World's Fair that occurred in Buffalo in 1901. As if Buffalo wasn't already the intersection or terminus point of many overlapping accounts that cause us to question the mainstream account, it hosted the World's Fair in 1901, or the Pan American Exposition, which supposedly represented the peace between North and South America. Very intriguing when we look at what the mainstream account tells us of the history between North and South America. We have our usual dazzling array of beautiful, incredible buildings with amazing domes, ornate detail, columns, and we'll be told that they're temporary. They were constructed for temporary purposes, and then you can find the many destruction photos of this World's Fair. Oh, it was also electrified, too, because apparently that was no challenge, even though this was all new technology. And that's what's always interesting about the so-called Industrial Revolution and the Second Industrial Revolution. It's not just the fact that they innovated all this technology on the fly. It's the fact that everybody seemed to know how to use it and was able to apply it very quickly. But don't question that. The mainstream account would never lie to you. And we have the usual depiction of various cultures, whether it's from Asia or whether it's how the Native Americans supposedly lived. And yet, this dazzling array of beautiful buildings that, even if they were just constructed for temporary purposes, take up so much space and clearly would have taken so much effort. But then you look at later World's Fairs in the 20th century and you see that such effort was no longer applied. Don't bother asking why. You'll just be told that, well, people worked harder, there were no safety standards, and we didn't have a Great Depression, even though, in a contradicting fashion, we supposedly achieved many architectural feats, including those great Art Deco buildings during the Great Depression. But just looking at the beautiful detail in these buildings, and the fact that the whole concept of the World's Fairs have come under such attack, criticism, critique, it just seems to tell us that there's a much deeper picture. I also find it interesting that many want to detach the concept of alternative research from the World's Fairs, because supposedly it's been debunked. Everything's been debunked by historians that were not there to personally witness these events. But your effectiveness and success as a historian depends on how well you promote and reinforce the mainstream account. It has absolutely nothing to do with independent thought or research. That's a reality. What a beautiful and gorgeous tower. And you can see the size and scale of it. And yet, even in the smaller buildings, you can see that, once again, no detail and no effort was spared. 
Yet we have the conflicting account of this World's Fair, as we do with many others, of the one building that wasn't constructed in time, or the one building that was constructed temporarily that had to be rebuilt in a permanent fashion. And here you can see as they're planning it out, supposedly. Nothing suspicious about this image, is there? Well, so many things in Buffalo, so many mysteries, and even considering the historical account from the Pan American Exposition or the 1901 World's Fair, where we seem to have some sort of strange intersection, or terminus, if you will, of eras or historical accounts. There's many mysteries about Buffalo, and there are many mysteries that you can still explore and see today. It's a beautiful city. And consider that. People try to stop that account. Thank you for joining me. Welcome to the Restituta Orbis channel and we're going to be taking a look at Niagara. One of the reasons that Niagara came across my mind, especially the Horseshoe Falls that we're looking at here, one of the components of the many falls of Niagara, is the vast amount of potential Tartarian evidence that we have here. We have several historical accounts that inform us that these are great power stations, and yet when we look at these remnants, it almost seems as though they have a different story. Well, just to get you oriented on the particular area that we're talking about, we have explored Buffalo in the past, and now we're just moving northwest of Buffalo with a few short miles distance to Niagara. It should be noted that there is a Niagara Falls, United States in New York, and a Niagara Falls, Canada. And one has to consider the fact that they may have once been the same city, now with an international boundary between them. The points of interest concern the many different falls and culminating in the horseshoe of the Niagara Falls. We also have several power stations that are around the falls here and here. We're also looking a little bit more closer though at some of the older power stations, such as this power station that we'll be looking at in grave detail. And this is part of the Toronto Power Generating Station. And of course, as you can see, it is arranged in the way that you can see a power station would be with its necessary columns and pediments and unique portal windows everywhere. Once again, why on earth do we have a very clear neoclassical building as a power generating station? Now, I understand the use of neoclassical buildings and the official account that says that they are municipal buildings, they are government buildings, they are capitals and they have many other uses and now we're saying it's a power generating station ah 1906 so we know that because that's on the building and then that sign on top which looks very expensive and well produced with an odd missing icon right there that this building must be legitimate and look at the detail here within this window and in the pediment above the door and it looks as though the columns are actually constructed in different pieces but still it's a very impressive structure especially considering that it's a power generating station. At least that's what we're told. And once again, this just feels like it's so absurd with the mainstream account that we really have to question it. For example, why do you need a pediment above this door? Why do you need the portal window? This is just a power generating station. Shouldn't this be an example of something, dare I say, more of a brutalist architecture structure would make sense? Or were they just not advanced enough to do brutalist architecture at the start of the 20th century? Well, all along the falls, it's lined with these power stations, and indeed, there's other locations that you can look in where you'll see the remnants of power stations, and I think that's what really gets our attention. For example, when we look at this view that was taken from one of the tour boats going through the falls, we can see the clear remnants of a power station over here on the Canadian side of the river. And keep in mind that we're not too far from Buffalo, which is the terminus of the Erie Canal. So if anyone wants to bring up logistical considerations, the answer is, listen, they built the Erie Canal at the start of the 19th century, so if they could do that at the start of the 19th century, anything could be done at the end of the 19th century or the start of the 20th century. And I agree, because that's what the official account always tells us. We're also going to be examining uh, these two very interesting buildings over here. One of these buildings being the Niagara Hotel and the other being the United Office Building, now called the Giacomo Hotel. And it's very interesting seeing how these two buildings line up in conjunction with the falls and all the power stations that we're looking at. We also have numerous accounts of caves and a vast underground that runs along Buffalo. So it seems as though we have many indications of a previous civilization, and no doubt this is what we would summarize as from the fourth era civilization. 
And I think that Niagara, whether you're on the Canadian or the U.S. side, is well worthy of an on-site exploration, and it's certainly worthy of a lot of follow-up explorations and investigation, as we can see where it falls and where it lays. Well, let's start with the Toronto Power Generating Station, built in 1906. And of course, this is the very well adorned with what they'd call neoclassical architecture, because the only way to build a power generating station is with neoclassical architecture. It is very well documented that it was easier to build neoclassical architecture in the early 20th century than the 21st century. And the reasons for this is there was a lack of safety standards, everyone had the capability, there were artisans to be found everywhere, and not to mention there were a slew of immigrants who spoke divergent languages, and yet they managed to come to a common understanding and they were able to pull off this very impressive edifice. And this is exactly the kind of building that you need to build if you're going to build a power generating station. And we'll take a look at it from the water side. And of course, you can see some of the very details that make perfect sense for a power generating station. I really think that the columns help add something to the appeal. Now, why does this not make any sense from our perspective? We can see older images of this power generating station, and we'll be given many different explanations for why such an edifice was constructed to be a power generating station and why we wouldn't build like this today. And yet when you look at some of the older photos, you're just taken in awe by how detailed and beautiful this power generated station was after it was constructed. It's one of the finest pediments I think I've seen, and look at the portal window there. Apparently it was so well adorned it had to be guarded and protected by members of the Canadian military, to include the Lincolnshire Regiment pictured here. And once again, we can see the details of this impressive power generating station. We do have construction photos, and as always, we have the usual, very well documented and very clear construction photos. And I had a comment where someone was talking about some of the quality of the photos, and I do find it interesting how when you try to use higher quality or find higher quality, mm, there just tends to be, how should we say, technical difficulties. Ah, yes. Isn't that exactly how you could envision such a beautiful building being constructed from the very start? And of course, you will not see a single construction photo of the columns, even though these columns apparently came in sections. So, I'm not exactly sure why. Again, it was probably the same reason why you don't get pictures of establishing the foundation. It's just very boring, and who would actually want to see that? Looking at the aerials, though, you're again given a different impression of what this building could have originally been used for. Was this actually some sort of administrative building originally in the older civilization, or did it have some other function? Obviously, it was repurposed to some other function, and then we believe that it was transferred to being a power generating station. But why exactly would they select this to be a power generating station? It's all very intriguing. And it really gets to be absurd when you look at this side because was this building itself somehow involved in power generation itself? Was that its architectural function? And here we have the image of the good old Packard truck from the 1920s hauling one of these large generators. And for some reason this generator looks very out of place within this particular structure. Well, just wait until we look on the inside of it. We do have more of our very well documented and very convincing construction photos supposedly. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here that's involved with the construction of this power generating station. I'm sure we'll be told there's some reason behind it. And yet, with some of the other photos that looks like they're actually working on it, you get the impression that the foundation and the original materials have already been there for some unknown number of years. And all that's really occurring looks to be like a cleanup, or a restoration even. I'm sure that's not what's happening. But I think to the great Keokuk power station that we looked at down in Iowa, which was only built about seven years after this, according to our mainstream account. And here you go again. You, you have the same issue, though, with a lot of these so-called construction photos, because you just have people standing around, and magical machines are just making magic happen in a very limited amount of time. And while that might sound dismissive or flippant, it's a story that we hear time and time again. It's also intriguing that we don't have a better chronological arrangement of the photos. And it's also fascinating that if they were building or involved in one of the largest hydroelectric stations at the time, you would think they would have done a better job of actually, you know, well documenting it, chronologically, having the photos labeled step by step, instead of giving us the hand wave. And of course there's a reason for that. Well, photos were lost over time, people didn't always appreciate history, 
And look at some of these tunnels here. The junction of the tunnel site, Toronto Power Plant, nearing completion. Does that really look like they just built that? Or does that look like something that's already been there? And we can compare and contrast it with a much more recent image taken by urban explorers. Now, we could just say that that was just recently built in 2023 and just arrange a bunch of debris on the floor and say that we actually built it in 2023. And then of course you have different uh, images of the photos and no one would question it. Well, you have the good old cornerstone lane photo and of course that should convince you that yes, this power generating station was really constructed in 1906. Stop asking questions and just move on. And if you really need evidence that we actually built this, here is your single perspective schematic because that's all you need to build a building just like you only need a single perspective schematic or a two perspective schematic for a patent. Yes, and I'm sure that any ingenious engineer just seeing this image alone could completely and very easily replicate this building from start to finish, because that's exactly what we'll be expected to believe and will be mocked for saying otherwise. Here's another one of the power generating stations and we can see that they have it labeled off and yet somehow this gives the impression of being far older even if it was built towards the end of the 19th century. Ah, here you go. Here's your plaque. And of course, the plaque will tell you exactly what happened and why you should believe the official historical account. And it also helps educate you to make sure that you know the official historical account and you don't ask foolish questions on your own. Ah, and then of course we have King George and Queen Elizabeth attending. And in the background, you can actually see the wonderful Toronto power generating station. I'm sure they were awed and impressed by it, and I'm sure Queen Elizabeth didn't ask any questions like, why are there marble appearing walls and neoclassical architecture around generators? That doesn't make so much sense. No, I'm sure she didn't ask any of those kind of questions, nor did the king. They were probably just having a grand old time. This is the actual Niagara power generating station, and even though it's an old world building, at least we can perhaps believe it being a little bit more of a functional power generating station, at least from what we would traditionally believe, and based on our background. There are so many tunnels and so many passageways with an unbelievable number of bricks. And where exactly did they get these bricks? Were these all manufactured in St. Louis at the time after that nasty riverboat fire that they had? Oh, and it's not just bricks, you also have very large blocks that make up a lot of these tunnels. And when exactly were a lot, a lot of these tunnels constructed? Now, we'll be told that the, this entire site has been augmented and added on to, but when you see photos like this, you can see what looks to be much older blocks that have been there for a very long period of time. How old is the bridge? How old is this overlook? And how old are the blocks that are in the immediate foreground in front of us? And then again, we still have older images of the old power generating stations. And we have images of the mills that used to be there as well that had to be destroyed to make way for the new power generating stations. It just goes on and on and on. I would like to walk through this tunnel and really get an idea of what this looks like. Now, why am I making such a big deal over these tunnels? Well, because excavating these tunnels is not exactly the easiest of tasks. Unless, of course, we're simply to take the word that in the 19th century, they had the logistical cheat code. And we can see that the so-called modern power generating stations on the Niagara Falls area have all been built on top of the existing infrastructure. And this is one of the older stations in Niagara Falls. And of course, we have a very good story, <clears throat> excuse me, I mean a very good historical account that tells us and shows us that it's very well documented. And that's this individual, Jacob F. Sholkopf, 1819 to 1899, and he was the hydroelectric power guru of Buffalo, New York. Another German, those Germans added again, the United States. Now, interestingly enough, he started as running his own tannery business and then somehow ascended to building the largest facilities of hydroelectric power and mills around the Niagara Falls area. And here you can see the remnants of one of them being destroyed. Very interesting and unique architecture. Do we really take all this at face value that he was the one responsible for this? And we can see these very massive generators once again in these wide array of power generating stations. Are these our generators or are these generators that we simply revived, renewed and repaired and restored to operation? Indeed, when we see a lot of the imagery here, we once again have the same kind of impression that we do when we look at the old architecture all across the land. 
we see what appears to be something of a different function than what we're told. And here you can see one of the most glaring examples of the new infrastructure, at least newer, built on top of the older infrastructure. So you have the impression that there's multiple civilizations that are apparent in both Buffalo and Niagara Falls. And here's yet another example of it. So how long has all this existing power generating infrastructure been here? And was it originally for power generation or did it serve a wide variety of other purposes? Indeed, this is how we would excavate today and establish tunnels with a very large tunneling machine, which is very difficult to operate and it takes a lot of time, especially clearing away all the rubble. And granted, it's easier for us, we would expect, because we have large machinery like this. We have motorized and mechanized transportation that would make removing the rubble relatively easy. And yet, nothing that we do with what we've dug compares to what exists in the past with the existing tunnels that were built brick by brick by brick. Take a guess on how many bricks you see in this particular picture. And again, this goes back to the whole tunnel concept of all these tunnels that runs under Niagara Falls. And yet, you don't just see bricks, you also see larger blocks and signs of more advanced construction. And are we to just believe that even though heavy machineries were in their infancy, according to our official historical account in 1890, that they managed to pull off all these stunning excavation and tunnel construction achievements? Again, you're hand-waving away the logistical challenge. And I understand that's exactly what we're told to do. It's not really a problem. They could have done it back at that time because they worked harder, they had no safety standards, and again, they had the logistical cheat code in the 19th century. It wasn't quite as good as the logistical cheat code in the 18th century, but it was still good enough to achieve all these wondrous construction of tunnels. And here you see that earlier image that we looked at that was supposedly documenting the construction, and I posit to you how difficult would it be to throw debris in the middle of that tunnel and say it was just being built in 2023. Who would even question it? And that's always the challenge that you have when you look at these older photos, regardless of their quality, is have they been manipulated? And even if they haven't, how do you know the account with the photo is accurate? And again, that's something that we tend to take at face value. Because think about just the sheer manufacture of all these bricks, and then the logistical transportation, and even if the brick manufacturer was located right next to the Niagara Falls, or wherever the bricks are being established, you still have to go through the labor of moving every single brick, placing every single brick, and then making sure that these structures endure. And how long have these subterranean structures truly endured? We even go to this example of uh, this cave that we have. We'll be told this is Cave of the Winds, which was apparently a tourist attraction from the 1830s. Yes, I said the 1830s. And it was unfortunately closed in the 1950s because it just collapsed. And then they had to dynamite it because it was unsafe. Because, you know, in the 1950s, we cared about safety more than we did in the 1830s to the 1890s, apparently. Again, there are remnants of what you can still tour on these particular caves and what's left of it and you can get a good view of the falls. What I'm wondering though with all this account that we have of caves and existing subterranean structures and then even here on the side of this face is this actually the remnant of an old building? Well when we look at the other photos one would be forgiven for thinking that yes this is the remnant of an artificial structure. And here's another photo from these caves during the winter time, because I guess nobody had anything better to do at that time than to go putzing around with their top hats on and their coats and exploring ice-covered caves. So what's really the story behind this photo? And as if it's not enough with the Cave of the Winds in New York, you also have this nice old world building that runs right to the elevator. So it seems to give multiple indications that you have true hardline evidence here in Niagara Falls that there were previous civilizations, and you can see the remnants everywhere that you look. Now, I suspect that these are primarily fourth era civilization remains, but there could be the remains of other civilizations, especially considering the subterranean, ten subterranean chambers. Now let's consider Hotel Niagara, built 1923 to 1925, and this is an example of 19th and 20th century revival architecture. What? 20th century revival architecture in the 20th century? That doesn't exactly make a lot of sense. And really the architecture behind this building doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's very impressive and we see the great foundation stones fit well together. I like how they seem to have tasked the lion's heads there with holding up that very cheap looking awning. 
For some reason, this building reminds me of some of the buildings that I've seen in Austria. And of course the explanation will be, well of course, because all the immigrants came over there and they built a building just like that. And it was very easy. And then you can see the United Office building next to the Hotel Niagara. Two very impressive structures in the city of Niagara Falls in New York. And we haven't even considered the Canadian side. We'll be getting to that in a subsequent exploration. This is Frank A. Dudley, a Knight Templar Mason. I never knew such a thing existed. Noble of the Mystic Shriner Order, or Shriner, son of the American Revolution, and a member of the New York National Guard. And he was the businessman, lawyer, politician who was responsible for building both those buildings. Now you're probably asking, okay, great, why do you mention the fact that he was a member of the New York National Guard? Well, because this was their armory in Niagara. You just can't make this stuff up. It seems the more you dig into it and the more you look, you always find more examples of old world architecture. And the Hotel Niagara does not disappoint. And it's a building that defies the usual classification that we have for architectural styles. So they just say, yes, it's 19th and 20th century revival. In the 20th century. Ha ha ha, joke's on you. Apparently this hotel was closed for a long period of time and they're working on remodeling it, but even after being in neglect for years, once again, it's an example of a building that you can see its past glory. It's also impressive that they're capable of renovating it and that it stood the test of time for so long. It's clear that this was once a very beautiful structure, although I had quite a great challenge of locating contemporary interior photos from, say, the 1920s and the 1930s. Fortunately for Mr. Dudley, he managed to jump on that building boom that occurred across the entire United States in the 1920s when they basically built all the great Art Deco skyscrapers in every city across the country in a very short amount of time. Because again, logistics were not a problem, you had skilled laborers everywhere, and you had an infinite amount of people and an infinite amount of money. Oh, and no safety standards, let's not forget that. I'm rather impressed though by the remnants that you see in this building even after its neglect. Well, now we go to the United Office Building, now the Giacomo Hotel, built 1929. And this is an interesting one. It's Art Deco, but it's Mayan Revival. Yes, we actually had a style of Art Deco called Mayan Revival. And why, you might ask? Because there's Mayan inscriptions on it. Wait till we take a closer look. I included this photo. I'm not sure how well this image is an actual photo, but it's very impressive, and it reminds me of the Plummer Building in Rochester, the way that many of these Art Deco buildings just glow. And then this postcard, how they just threw up that sign United on top of that. Doesn't that look really cheap and tacky? So they've just gone through all this effort of constructing this incredible building, and then they're going to put a really cheap sign on top of it that says United. Very fitting. Now on the top of the building, as with most Art Deco buildings, you can see some of the examples of the Mayan inscriptions, and they are extremely impressive. And yes, when we look closer at them, you'll really get the impression that they are actual Mayan impressions or artwork, or whatever you want to call it. Here's our one construction photo of it. Yes, another very convincing construction photo. What's with the tarps, anyway? Is that some kind of tarp technique or method of pouring the concrete, or the terracotta, as they say? And they tell us that this is a steel building, which is rather laughable, I think, because I don't think there's really much steel in this building at all. But, you know, if the mainstream account says so, who am I to argue with it? And now we look a little bit closer, and this is what they'll call, or what they'll tell us is the terracotta part of the building. And here you can see some very interesting symbols. What is the symbolism behind this building? And of course you'll be told, well, it's Mayan Revival. Because when you look a little bit closer, especially towards the top of the building, you'll see many of the reliefs that reflect what we'd be told, or what we understand to be Mayan figures. So just don't ask the question, why in the heck would a guy who had absolutely no affiliation with anything Mayan want to adorn his wonderful building with Mayan figures? How exactly does that make any sense? If he was a member of the Knights Templar Mason Order, wouldn't he not want to put figures of Knights Templars up there? You know, potentially to revive their shattered reputation over the years? Or something else? Something more American, more patriotic, since he was a member of the Sons of the American Revolution? Oh no! You're going to put Mayan figures up there because clearly many people across the United States had a deep respect for Mayan architecture. And it was part of the neoclassical time. It didn't come up any other time before or after, but it was part of, well, not neoclassical, but Art Deco. Now you can see how all these terms get confused. Bottom line up front, just don't focus on what you're seeing right in front of your own eyes. Don't focus on the anomaly that you see that there are Mayan figures right in front of you in a United States city and they were built and put on there in the 1920s. And you can see them everywhere you look. 
Yes, this is quite an anomaly, and this is something that stands out here in Niagara Falls. And remember, we're not that far from Buffalo, which we explored earlier. Unfortunately, this building has been uh, turned into a hotel, and you can still get an idea for some of its past glory. And isn't it intriguing how we have all these old world buildings that seem to be turned into hotels now, to include insane asylums, and we've looked at that. It looks like some of the remnants of the interior were not changed over time, but we suspect that the real reason that they do this is just so that they can change around the interior look of the building and nobody asks any questions. Although you can still get an idea in the entryway of what the greater glory of this building once was. And you can gain an appreciation for the actual civilization that I suspect that was really responsible for building it. Unless we just want to accept our mainstream account. And look, if you want to believe all that, that's perfectly fine. I'm just presenting an alternate view for things that don't make sense because you'll find plenty of examples if you look up this Mayan revival subset of Art Deco of these structures all across the United States and they're everywhere so why exactly did that suddenly become a thing and yet interestingly enough when you look up Art Deco you won't see any mention of Mayan revival you'll see something about well it's kind of a mix of every style from every culture and Egyptian but not Mayan oh, 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 well yeah Mayan too I mean, it's just amazing. You say something, then you backtrack, and you say something else. So, well, I hope you enjoyed this exploration of Niagara Falls. Thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. I'd love to stay, but...